Okay, let's get let's review our subject again. So the Gemara says like this. The Gemara says, I want to give you the full, full picture. The Gemara comments on the last Pasuk in the Torah, La, in the Megillah, sorry. The last Pasuk in the Megillah reads, from Mordechai the Jew was viceroy to King Ahasuerus. And you guys just mute yourselves so that you can. All right. There you go. I'll do it. Okay. But I, I unmute yourself to speak. So he was the vice to King, to King Ahasuerus and a great man among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brethren. Now, that's, that word, L'Roiv Echad, quite literally reads the majority. The majority of his brethren, and his brethren, the Gemara explains, is a reference to his colleagues. In other words, his fellow members of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court. Implication being, he was not popular with all of his brethren. Here we learn, this teaches us that some of the members of the Sanhedrin parted from him. Now, why did they? So the Gemara continues and says, Rabbi Yosef said, the study of Torah is greater than saving lives. Now, just to make clear, it does not mean that if someone is, is your witness to someone whose life is in peril and, the, and you study Torah, that's, that's greater than saving their life. That's not what the Gemara means. The Gemara means it's a vocation. There's no imminent danger. But what are you going to devote yourself to? To a community work that could save lives? Or to Torah study? So Rabbi Yosef is saying, choose the path of Torah study. That's what's going on over here. So that's why a minority of the Sanhedrin parted ways with Mordechai, because after the story of Purim, when there was no longer the imminent danger, Mordechai continued to, in politics, in government, as viceroy. So therefore, a part of the Sanhedrin, a minority, parted from him, because they are of this view, Rabbi Yosef, which nobody disputes, we have to understand, in the end of, of our discussion, it'll all be clear the different positions here, why Mordechai did what he did, and why the minority were not convinced, which is normally the case. Okay, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's get, get the story straight, what the Gemara says. So, Rabbi Yosef said, the study of Torah is greater than saving lives, and here's the proof. The context here is as follows. The proof is from the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra describes how King Cyrus became king of Persia following Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, now it's the rise of the Persian Empire and, and, and that conquers Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first base of Migdash. Cyrus was a benevolent king and allowed the Jews to go back to Israel to rebuild their temple, then it was halted. And the story of Purim takes place in between. In between the first and second temple, and right after, in fact, 70 years. 70 years after the destruction of the first base of Migdash, where the Jews were very encouraged by a prophecy that 70 years later they would return and rebuild the temple, and it started to happen. But then it was halted, and then it was completed. So in the book of Ezra, we get like this. The book of Ezra, who was the great Jewish leader that went up from Babylon to Israel. So, I'm sorry, initially, Ezra came later, I'm sorry, stand corrected. Ezra came later, a second wave. The first wave was led under Zerubbabel. Under Zerubbabel and Yeshua, not the Yeshua of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's time. So they went up, and the, and the book of Ezra tells us who went with them. So who went with them? So just to read you the quote here. Now, these are the children of the province that went up 
out of the capti- out of the captivity of those who had been carried away, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away into Babylon, and now returned unto Yerushalayim and to Judah, everyone to his city. Who came with Rezabovel? So they, we get the list of the leaders. And they were Yeshua, different spelling than Yeshua. Yeshua, not Yeshua, Yeshua, Nehemia, Sroya, Re'eloya, and Mordechai Bilshan, then Misper, Bigvai, Rechum, and Ba'ana. Now these names, except for Mordechai and Nehemia, these names uh, um, and not, not they, they, they didn't survive as in the sense of people naming people after them. We don't know why. I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason. It's an interesting thing. It's an aside subject. Why some names of the sages and patriarchs, etc., uh, endure and others did not. Certainly the patriarchs and the tribes, they've all carried on. But thereafter, in even that generation itself, in Moshe Rabbeinu's generation, look at all the names of the Torah, the heads of the tribes. Uh, uh, most of them were not, for whatever reason, People were not named after them. As you can see here, as I'm saying, these names are all unfamiliar to us. Except for Mordechai Nechemi. Okay, so note over here, the order, how they're listed. Here, this is the first, this is before the story of Purim. And again, I get a next account, 24 years later, after the story of Purim. So here, pre-Purim, Mordechai is listed, number what? Five. Who came with, Ze- with Zerubbabel? Number one is Yeshua, then Nehemiah, Sroya, Re'eloya, and then Mordechai Bilsha. Then we read. And then at the end it is written, and where is that? 24 years later. That's the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7, verse 7. There the order is. And the ones, it's describing the same event. It's describing the same event. Who came up with the Zubovel? But there it says, Yeshua, Nechemia, Azariah, Ramya, Nachmoni, and then finally Mordechai Bilsha. He's demoted one place. So from here we see, why was he demoted describing the same event? Because after the story of Purim, and he continued, to, be, to uh, be in, not to devote himself exclusively to Torah study. So therefore, scripture demotes him. That's the Gemara. Now let's review the Rebbe's questions. Why, question number one. Why does the Gemara have to bring a proof from Ezra and Nehemiah, right? Ezra is number... Five, and then the Chemi is number six. You can bring a proof from the Megillah itself. The Megillah itself says he was popular to what? Only the, mar- the majority. So there's, there's, he was demoted in the esteem of the, of the Torah sages. We see it right here. There's no need to bring a proof. So some commentaries say, right? The reason we have to bring a proof of scripture because the fact that some of the members of the Sanhedrin parted ways with him doesn't mean heaven agreed. But if it's so recorded in, in scripture, in Tanakh, in the book of Ezra, in the Chemi, that means that heaven also agrees. That's what some of the commentaries want to answer, why the Gemara has to bring a proof in addition to the, to the Megillah, because the Megillah is just telling us a story that some of the Sanhedrin didn't approve of Mordechai's choice. But how do you know that scripture, the Torah, that heaven, divinely inspired heaven approves. We see that from the, the, the scripture, the chronicles in Ezra and Nehemiah. Clear? Clear on the attempted answer. Why we need to bring a proof from Ezra and Nehemiah. It becomes part of Torah, that heaven. Now this answer is not very smooth because who, who disapproved of him? Members of the Sanhedrin. Is that, that's not enough to give it divine uh, uh, um, backing. These are members of the Sanhedrin. That surely is just as strong as scripture itself. That's one question we had. All right, remember, clear? Let's put that down on the, you sit number six, I'm so sorry.
Second question. If we're going to take this as the Gemara says, and no one disputes it, it seems that greater is Torah study as a vocation than to devote than, than, than a vocation that could potentially save, li save lives. If it's greater, why is he not demoted one, one rank? He should be completely removed from the list of, this, of, 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 of the Sanhedrin rule. Then a final question. It's been on for a long time. So why, if the majority held with it, why did the majority sway the minority to say, okay, you're right? Or, if not, and you need to, and, and in order to gain, in order to be accepted by all the members of the Sanhedrin, then stop what you're doing. If this, if this resistance continues, this opposition, and, and rejoin the Sanhedrin as a, as a great Torah sage, exclusively. Why does he continue? So here the question, either the minority should, like in every case of Allah, it's kind of a vote. So the minority should then acquiesce to the majority. Or if it not, then Mordechai, in order to be a full, fully embraced member of the Sanhedrin, should have given up his governmental position and returned to the Sanhedrin. Why didn't he? Okay, so the answer to all the above is the first obvious, the first obvious observation. And that is that it's not like the, the majority was silent. The minority disagreed in them and, and, and the majority didn't say anything. No, the majority were supported. The majority said, you're doing the right thing. It was the minority that said not. So therefore, the fact that the majority agreed with him now, so now, now expresses that they don't hold, they do not hold, that it's greater to devote oneself exclusively to Torah than to be in a position where you can potentially save lives. They say, no, you should be in a, potential, uh, in a position to save lives. So again, if that's the majority of the opinion, we're still stuck with why doesn't the minority appreciate this and go along with it, as in all cases of debates. The minority convinces, the majority convinces the minority. And a bigger problem is to have a contradiction. It comes out from the Megillah, since the majority supported him, is a very powerful question. We've got a contradiction. In the Megillah, the majority support him. That means it's no, we're given a choice of potentially saving lives or exclusive Torah studies as a member of the Supreme Court. No, you be involved in the community, hands on. That's what the Megillah is telling us, because that's the majority view. And yet in Scripture, in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see Scripture with the final words. It says, no, he's demoted one. It's a contradiction between what is expressed in the Megillah by the Sanhedrin and what's expressed in Scripture in the book of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, where post Purim story, it gets demoted. All right? These are the questions. We're clear? Everybody's following me? The plot thickens. To understand all of this, the Rebbe, this is so typical of the Rebbe that his profound insights are always gleaned from nuance in language. The precision of language in the, in the, in the Gemara and certainly in scripture. One of the unique hallmarks of the Rebbe's teachings is in an analysis of any text, whatever it is, Gemara, Rashi, it's a nuance and nuance, and that becomes the window in, in the language to a, a whole new understanding. So here, here's the beginning of this, of this journey. Note that Rebbe says that it doesn't say that the minority of the Sanhedrin argued with him. That, that's the usual language. They argued with him. Argue meaning, no, your position we don't, we don't uh, accept. And you should do as we say. The, the minority wasn't saying that. It was just pirushu. Pirushu means they separated. That's not saying they argued. Then what does this mean they separated? Or another expression we find amongst our sages, ein, elsewhere when there's conflict, ein ruach some of the sages were not pleased with their colleague. Doesn't say that here either. Doesn't say they were displeasure. Doesn't say they argued. They just said they, 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 they kind of separated from him. 
So what does it mean? So this is conveying that they're not arguing. Because they're saying, we understand your path and it's valid, but not for us. You hear, friends? This is what Pirishu means. With, with this little insight that we've answered a lot of our questions before, why the minority did not get absorbed within the majority? Because they're saying there's no argument. There's no real argument. They're saying what you're doing is right, but not for us. Some of us can't do this. You can, not us. The majority can do it. But the minority says, no, not for us at least. Why? Now we're going to explain. Huh? It's not like before you said it's not really a case that they get killed. I mean, they get killed. They are going to get killed. Look. No, this is after. Really, they're going to kill. That was, that was put down on this day. No, but no, no, no. This is a different case. Mordechai continued after the story of Purim for years. It's over. So Jew the main thing is after this. Yeah, with this whole discussion is post Purim, not up before. The whole discussion is after Purim. That's the whole thing. Till yeah, then, till yeah. till the story of Purim, even the minority said. Supporting Mordechai, yay. The whole argument here is post-Purim, and now the insight we're getting is not that wrong, but not for us. What does this mean? Why not for you? That's the question. The majority said yes for us. The minority said not for you, which explains why nobody's convincing anybody else because there's no conflict. You, it's right. Not right for us. What does this mean? We now we get we're going to explain. We start to explain last week, and we will we're reviewing at this point, friends. So the explanation that Rebbe explains is by introducing, telling us a story. He tells us a story. This is 1929, 1930. So the previous Rebbe had assembled a a meeting of Jewish leaders, all for Russian, which the Russian Empire, that was actually already communism, the Soviet, sorry, the Soviet Union, of course, included Ukraine. So it's so timely we're learning this. And he summoned a meeting of all the leaders to as to what to uh, what they should do in dealing with the communist government, etc. Just put this all in context. The previous Rebbe had been arrested and been sentenced to be executed. And uh, they was pushed off to 10 years in Siberia. And then miraculously, he was allowed free and left the country and continued to govern the Lubavitch underground from outside the country, which endured till the fall of communism. I'm tempted to talk about the current situation as your Robert is on, and I have much more shocking insight for you. Not, not secrets, it's just a perspective, but not for now. I'm talking about the, 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 what's happening in Ukraine. Anyway, Hashem is running the world, and it has to be all good without delay. Okay, let's get back to my study. So the previous Rebbe, this Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, the Rebbe's father-in-law, the Rebbe calls a meeting, and amongst them was the famed Rabbi Yosef Rosin, the Gon, the great of Rogachev, outstanding, outstanding scholar. So at the meeting, they decide, the decision was made to make a small committee, like, like, a, like a working committee, to meet on a much more frequent basis for the benefit of Russian jury. And he was asked to join, the Rogachava was asked to join this committee. And he said, he, he declined. And he said, this depends, this depends whether I should join or not, depends on the argument between the Talmud Bavli, the Babylon, Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. What's the argument? And, and as you'll see, he's, he says, I, the Babylonian Talmud came later, and Allah is like them, we'll soon explain why. And therefore, that's the reason he declines. What's the argument? So the argument is as follows. It 
at the end of tractate brachas, right? Just to remind you how the Babylonian Jerusalem Talmud works, they, they're both commentary analysis of the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the primary text of both. And it's the sages in Israel discussing it. That, that was the first Talmud. And then later, the Babylonian Talmud in Babylon. 100 years difference, at least. But there was an overlap. 100 years just in the extreme. But there was an overlap also in, in, in some, to some degree. So in the end of tractate Brochus, which is the Mishnah. So they, they both have commentary on, on, the, on, the, on the Mishnah, on the, on the tractate. So, the, so there the Gemara says like this, that the early sages would spend nine hours a day in prayer. So the Gemara says that they, look, they spent nine hours a day in prayer. So how was their work done? They work really their Torah study. And their work, both, sorry, both work and Torah study. So each Talmud answers, they're basically the same answer, but there's a little difference in the language. Babylonian Talmud says, Talmud Bavli, since they were chassidim, their Torah was preserved and their work was blessed. So whatever they learned, they didn't have to review it over and over again. They remembered it. And so therefore, in a short time, they were able to to, to uh, amass a lot of knowledge because they were chassidim, their Torah was, was preserved and they could, next subject, next subject, next subject. Those who are not chassidim, in order to remember Torah, you got to review it many times. They didn't have to do that. And hence they could, they could pray for nine hours and, they, and the little, out, uh, little hours left in the day, work was blessed, a little bit of effort and the work was blessed successful, right? The prophet came with little effort and their Torah study was preserved. Whatever they learned, they remembered. They, they could therefore go on to the next subject and then and cover much ground, both quantitatively and qualitatively. However, the Jerusalem Talmud has a different, a different one word difference. The Jerusalem Talmud says, because they were pious, because they were Hasidim, this is, not Hasidim, Baal Shem Tev, says, that's thousands years later. Because they were pious, their Torah and their work, or their work and their Torah was blessed. When it comes to Torah, the Babylonian Talmud says the Torah was preserved. When it comes to Jerusalem Talmud, the Torah was blessed. What's the difference? When you say preserved, that means what you learned, you remember. By the way, they learned things once, remembered forever, fantastic. That's incredible blessing right there. But blessed means in that short time that they learned, not only did they remember, they're able to discover and innovate and innovate, which would normally take, if you're not pious like them, that would take a lot of time of deep thinking and analysis and discussion back and forth. And then, boom, new insight. They will discover these insights profoundly, immediately. So it's not only a not only that whatever they learned, they retained. But in that short time that they had left for the day, they had tremendous discovery, which normally would take so much longer. So the Rogge Chava said, the, I'm, I'm of the Babylonian ilk. So if I'm going to devote myself to communal affairs, so yes, my Torah will be what? It'll be preserved, but I'm going to be missing the innovation, the discovery that requires so much more time and effort. And therefore, I, if there's nobody else who'll do it, but if they're out, that's the point. Someone else will do that. He's not saying if the whole committee depended on his participation, obviously he would participate. But there were others. So given the choice, he says, following the Babylonian Talmud's ruling that the Torah is merely preserved but not blessed. He says, I cannot afford, therefore, to give all these many hours that this is going to requ require because I don't have the blessing. I have the preservation of my Torah study, but not the blessing. Why? Because the ruling is like Bavli. Okay, that's what we're up to. Clear? This was a summary of our discussion from last week. Yeah? So now we're up to chapter 5, page 400 in the text. You can get it up there, friends.
going deeper. Yes, Loimar. The Rebbe suggests as follows: I has been a machleik the explanation of this argument. Being vavli rishalmi, this argument between the Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud, Koroch is bound up a heavily in the distinction. She mean darkly mudem. They're whole different way of learning Torah. Remember, Jerusalem Talmud said, if you're pious, then your Torah is blessed. Babylonian Talmud says, if you're pious, your Torah is preserved. Why does each one have this different position? Because these different positions are reflective of the whole different nature of the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. What's the difference? Beautiful, listen carefully. How, is the, how does the Babylonian Talmud work? If you learn it, if you learn Gemara, when you learn Gemara, basically you're learning Bavli. So how is it? It's Ribu Yishal Shakla Vitali. There's a lot of back and forth and argument and, 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 and questions and contradictions and resolutions. Kedivriya Gemara, the Gemara itself says like this, describing its own Talmudic, its own Talmudic, uh, uh, its own Talmud, its own Talmudic genre. There's a Pesach that says in the book of Eichon, the book of Lamentations, which we say on, on Tisha B'Av, the Machasha, it's in italics there, the Machashaki Mashivani, Hashem placed me in darkness. It's referring to the destruction of the temple and we're plunged into darkness. Says the Talmud Bavli, this is their Talmud Bavli, a Talmud Shabavli. This is an allusion to the Babylonian Talmud. That's what happened. They left Israel and they went into Babylon and that's spiritual darkness. What's the metaphor here? The way the Babylonian Talmud works like someone in the dark who's trying to get out of the room and he is touching the doors and cupboards and is this an opening? It's not an opening. Here's a handle that opened. This shall kush is to ask so yes, there's a lot of search and toil. He's in, he's in the dark. Lishel Kushius, we mean it's not metaphorically asking questions. And to make yard tests. Does this, does this fit? Until you come to a conclusion, this is the final ruling. We've got to measure it against all kinds of other questions and statements and quotations. And it's a very, very laborious and very uh, a process. As anybody who learns, the Gemara knows, Talmud knows. And that's why the, the, you look on the shelf physically, the commentary of the Talmud Bavli on the six orders of the Mishnah takes up a whole shelf. And if he trans the art scroll translates, it takes up five shelves. Translated. We look at the Jerusalem Talmud on the shelf, it's a fraction of the size, it's a third of the size. The Talmud Yerushalmi is explaining the same Mishnah, the same Halachas, the same Mishnayas, but it's straight. The discussions are very, very brief right away. Oh, this is the conclusion. Why? You see, it's, the light is on. So he's in a dark room and he wants to go out. The light's on. There's the door. Out he goes. It's not a whole discussion. Is it? In that door, it is a door, but it leads you to another room which doesn't let you get out. That's a window, and that's a cupboard, and it's a... No such discussion. The light goes on. So now, um, now we also understand why, because the Jerusalem Talmud is in Israel, Jerusalem. Israel is a holy place. It's where God's manifest. So truth is more self-evident. And Babylon is confusion. Bovel, Babel, the word Babel. It's an English word now. It means confusion. Why? Pardon? Why does it mean confusion? Because the king of Bovel was very clever. And he, every country that he conquered, he picked out the population and he transplanted them so people shouldn't develop nationalistic aspirations living on foreign soil. He mixed up the whole world. That's why the word Babel needs to mix up. Now you know why. So in, Bov in, in Bovel, it's spiritually dark. It's not the Holy Land. Uh, our sages say about Israel, just the air makes wise. Unless you want to, you know, we always have free choice. You can turn your back on it. 
But just being in the holy land on the holy soil brings a certain enlightenment that it doesn't require a lot to open your eyes and see the truth. Unless you walk around with shut eyes. I don't want to see. I don't want to see. I don't want to see. Don't tell me. Don't talk to me. No. Can't help you. Can't help you. So you want to open your eyes. I can inspire you to open your eyes. Hopefully. Not hopefully for sure. But if you do open your eyes, it's obvious. Truth is obvious there. So therefore the Jerusalem Talmud, when any discussion of any halacha, it's trick chat. Questions, answers, it's obvious. This is the halacha. This is the ruling. This is the meaning. Whereas in Bovel, darkness, the Mahashaki, Shivani, he placed me in darkness to arrive at the truth as a whole. It's a great, great toil and effort. Therefore, now we understand the two positions on the same subject. If you're pious, is your Torah preserved? But not more than that, or is it blessed? The Fich comes out, so according to the Babylonian Talmud, it's possible, if you're pious, then the best you can get is your Torah be preserved. You won't forget anything you learned. And that's an extraordinary thing. They won't forget their study. But it's in a place of darkness. You cannot access any higher blessing than that. But to access divine manifest blessing that you discover inside. The light is on, the light is on, the light is on. It's not. Preserve. But the light, no. Right away perceive the truth. Can't in Babylon. It's just not available. The truth is discovered only through great toil and effort. This is not the way the Babylonian Talmud can discover truth because it's in Babylon. Ah, I will if you should decide to show me. But according to the position of the Rishalmi, no. If you're pious, you're connected, you're devoted. Not only is your Torah study preserved, but the light. Their learning is such a bracha nitenis, but it also is a bracha. Blessing. It's blessed. Divinely kissed and graced. They grasped the truths immediately was self-evident and didn't have to delay and, and uh, the labyrinth of questions and contradictions. Everything was clear. That's the Jerusalem Talmud. Direct light. There's direct light and there's reflective light. We're not going to the distinction now. Like now Babylonian Talmud is reflective light. Jerusalem Talmud is direct light. Shabim, as explained in Hasidus, but you get the sense. Shabim, my gi and miyad, la mitosi shala inye, and there in the Jerusalem Talmud, in the Holy Land, and especially in Yerushalayim. What's Yerushalayim? Yerushalayim means two things. Yerushalayim, perfect awe. The awe of God is complete and whole there because you feel his presence. And the second related meaning is Yira, vision, see. Sholim, complete, whole, perfect vision. Truth is evident, and that engenders the, the awe. So the Jerusalem Talmud is, it's visionary. There's light. Yerushalayim. Yira. To see and be in awe. And therefore, it's a different level of Torah study. And if a person is a chassid, there, ah, the Torah is blessed. Now continue. Applying all of this to Mordechai and his colleagues. You see where this is going. Fiyom Ola'el, chapter 6, it's called a bit further. Givald, Givald. Yesh We could suggest. Shahev, they'll be in Shittas. The Rebbe is so humble. <laughs> we can suggest. Once the Rebbe explains it, that of course, this is exactly what it's saying. But suggests. Shahev, they'll be in Shittas Mordechai. The difference between, now we understand that they're not arguing. They're not arguing. What comes out? You can see yourself where this is going. That the minority said, I'm sorry, we're Babylonian Talmud guys. So we got to separate from you. We can't, we can't take your path. You're holding level of the Jerusalem Talmud. Now 
not argued. Pirsha, your path, our path. And we'll answer all of the other questions we had too. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's read in the text. The difference between the position of Mordechai Harotzi, Loroyev Sanhedrin, which the majority of the Sanhedrin endorsed and said yes. In contrast to the minority, it's all this position. They're all expressive of these two different positions of the Bavli and Yerushalayim. The position of the great Sanhedrin. The great Sanhedrin they were the choice leaders chosen from the minor Sanhedrin. Of which there are more than one minor Sanhedrin. Where was the great Sanhedrin physically located? This is significant. The place was in Jerusalem. Or at least in Israel it had to be, if not in Jerusalem. Masimo, this accord, this make this is dovetails. As logic would lead us to conclude, this is the Jerusalem Talmud path, state of being, consciousness, where they physically located in Israel or better still in Jerusalem. And what period are we talking about? We're talking about the period when the Mishnah was composed. This is before the friend, this is before the, the, the Talmuds were even composed. They actually physically composed later. But they, obviously, the Sanhedrin in general, in Jerusalem, that's the Jerusalem Talmud path. However, Achgam Oz, that even then, Hoyotanoim, they were sages, they weren't impervious to Babylon. Exile started to encroach. It was already then the Babylonian Talmud level, a descent. Even though this is pre, pre both Jerusalem Talmud and Babylonian Talmud, but on some subtle level, the two elements are here. Where do we see that? There were sages that came from Babylon. As we, as we, we in hindsight know that Hillel Ola, Hillel came from Babylon. Rabbi Nosan Abavli, Rabbi Nosan the sage came from Babylon. Void and other sages. So it wasn't exclusively. Only the Jerusalem elevated consciousness already. There were those living in Babylon that had come and joined, come to Israel, bringing with them the Babylonian state or mindset. Okay, we'll stop here and continue. I'm going to add more history to understand this clearer, what was going on at the time. But you see, we're already getting some insight here, as we said earlier. Mordechai is the Jerusalem level, and the majority of Sanhedrin are holding on that level. The minority that separate, but don't say, stop, just not for us, is the Babylonian Talmud level. With the Torah, it can be preserved, but not blessed. And much more detail and richness and depth, God willing to follow. So next Sunday, it's still before Purim. Beautiful. So Be'ez HaShem will end this. We will conclude it. Uh, next week. So we say these final words of the Megillah, friends, you'll have such a rich, deep appreciation of the words. Have a wonderful week. Shkoyach, Rabbi. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Huh?